Item 4003 is an ordinance uh, adding chapter 294 to the codified ordinances of Jackson County, making provisions for a county hearings officer on its first reading. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, like you said, this is the first reading. There'll be a public hearing and second reading on February 19th, 2003 at 9.30 a.m. in the courthouse auditorium. We've been working on this for close to three years, and what we seek to do with this is a couple of things. Uh, even before the courts got uh, into some financial problems that are unable to handle some of our civil matters uh, as quickly as they would like to, and we would like to as well, we found ourselves in a situation where we had a little inconsistency from the courts when a code violator was sent to the courts. Uh, and frankly, they had higher priorities than some of our issues with animal control and code violations and a few restaurant violations as well. So what this seeks to do is to provide a hearings officer for these county enforcement issues. The person can be brought before and the matter adjudicated. We hope to do a couple of things. One, expedite it and it'll go more quickly. Two, provide consistency in the enforcement so that a code violator knows that this is the course of action the county will be taking and the escalating course of action if there's no uh, compliance. And we also intend that it will pay for itself, which we think we have that set up with the fee structure. This is very much an experiment in creative adjudication of uh, code matters. Uh, if we find that it's not paying for itself, we'll stop it and we'll do something else that's important. We don't have additional funds to subsidize new programs, so if it doesn't pay for itself, we'll, we'll fix that. Um, but I'm rather excited about it because I think it'll do a lot of things. We had the courts in here earlier when we were talking about it, singing our praises for taking this off their off the table and off the agenda for them, I guess even before Measure 28 and some of the other uh, things that have happened that have caused them to cut back the services they can provide. So I wholeheartedly recommend it to you on first reading. It could be more meaningful now than ever before. Could be. It could be. It could be. It's just more needed than ever. Yes. Yeah. So who do you envision being that person? Uh, they would be, uh, the hearings officer would be appointed uh, by the county. We would contract with them. We have not selected anyone. We've not recruited for anyone yet. Uh, so of course, don't have the ordinance in place yet, but it would be someone we would imagine who would have some experience that would lend them the ability to interpret our county code and to make reasonable judgments. This is not a bad time to be doing this either because anyone who has interpreted our past ordinances and code uh, will be able to kind of start fresh with our new LDO and comp mm -hmm. plan. And Lots of things going on. And a lot on. of changes we're making anyway, so uh, someone who would be appointed to do this would uh, be kind of starting fresh right along mm -hmm. with us. So it's not a, not a bad time to do it. That's a good idea. And it's the first week. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, I move that we pass our first reading on and pass on the second reading, ordinance number 2003-5 in the matter of adding chapter 294 to the codified ordinances of Jackson County, making provisions for a county hearings officer. And setting a second reading, public hearing for Wednesday, Wednesday, Wednesday February, February 19th, 2003 at 9.30 a.m. Is that part of your agenda? Yes, I can amend it to include that. <laughs> With that uh, motion to adopt this in the on the first reading and the second reading of public hearing, I'll second it. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 Item 302 is an ordinance um, adding Chapter 294 to the codified ordinances of Jackson County, making provisions for a county hearings officer. Yes, Mr. Chair, this has been a long time in process, and we're very happy to have it before you for the public hearing today. This hearings officer ordinance grew out of a need in our code enforcement, animal control, and environmental health programs. Uh, primarily, a couple of things were going on. One was there was inconsistent handling and management of our code enforcement cases with the courts, and that largely had to do with the fact that, frankly, our code enforcement cases were relatively low priority for the circuit court. So they were very pleased to see that we were interested in finding a way to try to handle these ourselves because it relieves them of a burden and in light of Measure 28 and the other state cutbacks, they're not going to be able to handle them anyway. So the coincidence of us developing this hearings officer ordinance has really worked out well for the courts as well as for us. So our goal is to have a consistent 
management of code enforcement, animal control, and restaurant violation cases that we've not been able to get in the past. And it's also to ensure that this is a, a self paid program and if we find that our work in progress isn't self-paying we will discontinue it and go to some other sort of program but the idea is that it will pay for itself and provide better service uh, in our code enforcement issues. County Council advised me on Monday that there was, or Tuesday I guess it was, there is one amendment that he's recommended that we add to the ordinance and Doug McGarry from County Council's office will read that into the record and I assume we want to do that now before you have yes. a public hearing. Okay, Doug, you want to come up and uh, read that into the record? Uh, Doug McGarry from County Council. Uh, there is just a slight change that uh, is not significant, should not require a whole new rereading of, this, of the ordinance uh, for passage, <coughs> if that's your choice. And that would be on page 11, uh, it's two, under uh, section 2, what would be 294.20 category, or uh, subsection C. And in there we're talking about uh, the ability of the uh, hearings officer to enforce some of his judgments, and those have always been an area of, of, uh, of uh, some, well, obvious importance, and it's kind of tricky. So, uh, in there, if you notice, uh, it says that, uh, let's see, we're, we're, I can read, it's just at the very, uh, in the middle of that paragraph, of, of paragraph C, and it states that if the defendant fails to comply with the judgment order within the time specified, the hearings officer or county may compel compliance by application for a writ of the circuit court or any other lawful method, and that's, those, that's the language I'd be adding there, uh, to enforce such orders. Uh, before, the way it was written, it was only a writ that you could uh, take to the circuit court, and that was somewhat uh, confining in terms of what uh, possible methods or other uh, means would be uh, could be used to uh, make sure that the uh, that that the hearings officer's actual judgment could be enforced, and so by adding this uh, small phrase or any other lawful method, it just allows it just allows it, uh, the counts. So we would eliminate all of line four. Uh, it would just be adding some language there, and that would be so you're not, not adding eliminating the language. anything. You'd just be adding. Yeah, adding some language right after uh, circuit court, and it says, or any other lawful me method. This has it. I think the version before you has that revision. Yeah, it this, does. this is the reversion. I just wanted to know. The, the, yeah, the so we're adding or <laughs> eliminating. No, the version. The, the version, revision. yes. Revision of the version. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, thanks. So that's okay. Do you have any questions? Right here. We'll make that part of our motion. If we adopt this. All right, I'm going to go ahead and open the public hearing on item 3002, an ordinance adding chapter 294 to the codified ordinances of Jackson County, making provisions for county hearings officer. Anyone uh, wishing to speak to this? Please stand up. Good morning, Walt. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is uh, Walt Fitzgerald. I live in Sam's Valley. There was one statement here that I have a little bit of a problem with, and that statement was that this is a self-paid program. Can that be explained a little bit? Because that makes me a little bit uncomfortable when government's out there paying for itself without public approval. I, I kind of have a little trouble with that, so can you explain that a little bit better? Just like, uh, Walt, when you would have a circuit court matter that, or a small claim that you wanted to file, there are filing fees with those issues. There's a fee with this. It's our belief that the person who's involved in the code enforcement issue is the one who should pay the cost for his or her situation rather than the taxpayers in general. That's why we've not recommended that we supplement this with any of the county's general funds or other funds, that it would be fee supported. Our justice court actually operates that way also, that it's self-supporting through the, the fines and that. So 
Yeah, I like the place I have a little bit of a little bit of uncomfortable, and I, I this wouldn't wouldn't cause me to vote against this by any means. Uh, we just have to be aware of potential uh, problems could come up, but uh, saying the circuit court could compel obedience uh, by proceedings for contempt, that's open-ended. Now, you could have uh, you know, a circuit court judge could say, well, you, know, you, you haven't complied with such, such a fine, it might be a relatively small fine, uh, you, we'll put you in jail for a year. Uh, they could conceivably do that because uh, circuit court judges, the contempt, uh, basically that is open-ended, whatever the judge decides to do at that time. And so you have to realize that is kind of built into this. Uh, and that's something that we have no control over. Uh, so uh, it's a, Mr. Chair, yes. question to County Council: Is that not the case under the I current? I refer to Doug. He's working. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. In terms of, of contempt, uh, it's always a issue when it comes to uh, judicial practice of, of how much uh, someone can be penalized at some point. That even asking the question or even asking the, the, for the uh, for the penalty of contempt is something in which. Uh, you're depending upon the district attorney, or in this case, the county council, uh, or that kind of judgment as to whether or not that's an appropriate type of of, uh, of uh, penalty to even grant. And then, then the judge has to make that determination whether that's appropriate. And then, if it is appropriate, how much? Uh, if something's bad enough, in which uh, you conceivably, you know, I can't imagine a year, but I mean, I can imagine a day or two. Uh, if you don't do something uh, that's been ordered by you, by the court to do. Now, again, I can't think of any particular situation that I've been involved in the last uh, three years, four years now, that uh, doing code compliance would require that. But, uh, you know, the actual disobedience of a court order at that point, uh, or in this case, hearings officer's order, um, where it's it's uh, actually an affront to the dignity of the hearings officer and it's and the whole proceeding. Then at some point, if uh, you know a contempt is requested, it would have to go through a process, and that's what we provide for in your hearings ordinance. It's just not you're in contempt, you know, bail it, throw him in jail. It's one of those things where yeah. we, we would actually have to go through a process, ask the court to say. Uh, yeah. And I realize this would be sort of a last uh, last stage uh, of the whole process, but still, it's uh, uh, what bothers me is that can be open ended, uh, and sometimes it can be if the judge is really angry, someone's been screaming and hollering at him. He says, "Well, I'm just going to lock you away." Uh, and that, that does happen. It does happen. Uh, and, and contempt is actually is used as a strategy. We use it for quarantine for TV patients. Uh, I mean, it's actually used as a strategy to you know, put people to in a situation where we can force uh, compliance. Force compliance, but it, it is open ended. It is open ended. I mean, not that I would use that as a reason to vote against this, but uh, people have to realize that's a potential. That is that problem. is definitely a reality. Yeah. We we have not increased the jurisdiction of the circuit court. I mean, they have those that right already. Yeah. We're just plugging into that. As long as they you know don't exceed their right and, and they do things that are reasonable, we have no control over it at that stage. Well, we wouldn't have the ability to exceed it anyway. Mm -hmm. No. We yeah we don't we haven't had a problem with that. In fact, I think one of the reasons we want to handle this is that uh, that the courts really because these uh, are code compliance and not criminal they or civil they they kind of. Uh, don't give them the attention that they should have. So I think we've had kind of the opposite reaction to code sure. compliance cases. So I guess it's just not been a problem so far. Yeah, I do fall through the cracks. That's been a problem. That's yes. why we have to have this. I understand that. But uh, now that, that's the only part that, that bothers me a little bit. Even though hopefully it'll never get to that stage. That's so. it. And that's the thing is, is if you don't have uh, the end result there, then uh, you're right. So it is, in a sense, a strategy in the sense that it, that's always a possibility and if the person always has a question mark in his mind, it's just how far can he push a judge or right. what have you. And how convincing can a hearings officer be to a judge to get in a contempt? So there's a, a lot of, of uh, I, I think that we do have control over it. I think it's a matter of, of proper direction to, to us in terms of those enforcing that law. Uh, that you folks can press upon us in terms of you know what what kind of behavior you want from us, but at the same time, uh, yes, ultimately a court does have you know uh, the nasty business of having to make some of those big hard decisions. I, I can't imagine it. I, I take that. I do recall one in which a, a gentleman did not uh, was not a gentleman did not get in front of even though he had code violation he refused to 
accept the court as uh, you know as uh, as having any authority. Refused to stand up. Refused to get. And, and he was you know put in jail for at least for the couple hours until the ring was over. But that's the only time. Thank you, Doug. Uh, any other questions? If not, uh, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Anyone wishing to uh, speak? We've opened it, and we'll continue. Anybody else with me? Yes. Um, my name is Dave Curley. live in the Medford area. I'm going to have to agree with uh, Mr. Fitzgerald here. Anytime that we start having fees paid for by the citizens when they don't really have a choice in the matter, nobody knows who's going to be setting these fees, are they going to be fair, you're wanting to open up a whole other bureaucracy here to have a code enforcement officer, then you're going to have to have his building and his staff. And what are the cases going to be? How much are you really going to have to charge somebody for having a barking dog or a building built too close to a property line? And if we do decide to have this, I think that it should be paid for out of the county funds. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. The, uh, the current system, as uh, these code cases go to circuit court, people do pay fines already. Yes, they do. That money goes to the state to maintain those courts. So and it, we're not changing the system other than saying we'll handle it in-house now. Well... They already uh, have to pay fines if they violate. It's like violating a law. That's right. But then you're having a judge issue the fines which is the proper person to be issuing fines, not somebody that is a county employee. It should be somebody that is elected to the bench and in the judicial branch. I don't think that you should just be charging the citizens because of a problem that they have. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Good morning, Jean. Jean Wallman, Eagle Point. Um, I haven't read the whole thing, so I'm not sure what this is, but it seems to me we're just adding another layer of bureaucracy. I'm wondering why we're doing that in a time when we're obviously strapped for money. And you say, okay, it's going to be paid for out of the fines. Well, that to me looks like it just sets us up for abuse of the system because it's... Uh, it, the man's paycheck depends on him issuing fines. So, uh, why not? Explain this is things. funding the hearing officer. We're not funding the code enforcement guy. This is a different matter. This okay, is funding who the is, judge. Who is funding the code enforcement? General funds. Yeah, general funds. You and I are. Okay, then what is this funding exactly? The hearings officer, the cost of contracting with the hearings officer to act as a judge. Okay, so it is to his benefit to see that there are fines paid, is that correct? No. There's a fee to enter the system that pays for it. The fee to enter the system, where does that come in? It's paid by the person who's charged with the violation. Okay, so he is charged with the violation. What is he paying for? The hearings officer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it, he has violated something and now he has to come before the hearing officer. So he has to pay his fine to pay the hearing officer, correct? He hasn't, has, he may have a fine or some sort of an assessment, but there's a cost involved to have the hearings officer. This is Commissioner Capillas pointed out in the Justice Court. The Justice Court pays for itself with the work it does. We intend this would operate the same way and not be supplemented by the taxpayers. This is not a bounty system. The hearing mm -hmm. officer doesn't get more money mm -hmm. by finding people in violation. He gets a fixed amount of money to decide these cases impartially. That money comes to the county. Our hope is that it will offset the cost of the hearing mm -hmm. officer. If it doesn't, we'll stop it. Mm -hmm. Okay, but if he wants to be heard before the hearing officer, a fine or a an amount has to be paid, correct? No. No. Doug, do you want to talk about the details? There's some confusion. The 
Sure. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah. <laughs> there's some, there's, there seems to be some confusion. Well, no, that's, that's understandable. Um, the, the, the method or system would be essentially, at this point, we, a $100 fine uh, that's granted or is given or penalized against the defendant at this point goes over to the court. And our, we don't really have any type of system of recouping those costs. If, this, if $25 comes out of it, that basically goes back to the general fund. As uh, in the concept at this point would be that the fines would be commensurate with the kinds of costs that are going to be associated with doing a code enforcement. Uh, every type of code enforcement case is going to be different for in, in costs in terms of a barking dog. It's going to be cost different than a uh, than investigating a, a case involving a septic system. So those costs are being calculated at this point with each department as to the appropriate or, or the amount of fine that a person would receive upon being convicted of that of that violation. And if they're not convicted, then the person doesn't pay the fine. If, it, if I if in listening to how you explain it, in this particular case, I'd go right back to saying uh, <laughs> that we're we are establishing a cost based on um, the code compliance officers being active doing that. That is not being that is not part of this ordinance. The right. only thing that that is involved with this ordinance is is that the hearings officer, if we derive enough money in code compliance uh, fines to pay the salary and operational cost of a hearings officer, uh, we're going to, we would be establishing that hearings officer. If it doesn't pay that, then we're not going to do it. But it has nothing to do with the actual code compliance inspector people going out there and saying, you've got a violation. You're right, that's a okay, different so issue. Just but, the hearings but the cost, right, the cost of, of a code compliance, of being in front of a hearings officer, the amount of time that, that paying for that hearings officer, because each department is going to essentially have to uh, assist in recouping the cost associated with that hearings officer using, I mean, that the cost that over the overhead that's associated with a uh, with the hearings officer. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, always in the past, also people have had several warnings before they actually get uh, a violation against them. We don't go out and uh, the, the first time just hand them a violation without an opportunity to clear up whatever they're violating. So it isn't as if somebody's going to be out there looking for, you know, trouble. Uh, because I, I think we have uh, a very fair system. I've worked a lot with code compliance, and uh, I know that we really bend over backward to help people uh, get into compliance before they actually get into this situation. And by the time they are actually uh, in front of a court, uh, the success rate from the county standpoint is almost 99%. Yeah. I mean, it's by that time, you know, everyone's admitting that they're in violation. Now, there, of course, there's situations where uh, maybe someone's found not, you know, there's been situations where people have been found not guilty. And under this system, um, you know, they nothing would change. They would not be charged. With, and, uh, and now we have the courts talking about closing uh, another day over there. So they have. if you want to expedite the process of getting com code compliance issues dealt with on a fair basis, uh, this just expedites that process. And, and we're hoping it works because we don't want to feel that the taxpayer should have to step up and uh, subsidize an additional hearings officer, which is now being take, taken care of by the state courts, uh, as an additional cost to the taxpayers of Jackson County. So I don't think that that's what anybody wants, but if it pays for itself, I think the fairest system is developing this ordinance and getting it started. And, it, and it's a lot faster way of doing it than what we'll be seeing in the future with having an additional one day eliminated from the state court. So, yeah. Doug, uh, what's the delay now as far as getting cases before the circuit courts? Uh, with uh, the previous five there, courts? There's not, there's not really too much of a delay. Uh, it's uh, because we will cite someone in and that's the site date. So we normally cite them out like a week or two weeks. Um, and then the problems that it is is that the courts 
uh, you know, raise their eyebrows. They say, you know, I really wish, you know, this would happen. Can you guys resolve this issue? Uh, the courts really don't want to hear it. Uh, by the time we get to the court, it really is at that stage of we can resolve it, but we end up resolving it really uh, to no advantage. It's just a loss to the county in terms of how much uh, time is spent and energy is spent on something in which it's as simple as you should have gotten a permit before you did this, and now you're refusing to do it, and why are you doing it? Well, because, you know, I just haven't gotten around to it. And so that's an incredible amount of cost associated with code enforcement. It's something in which we end up having to kind of, to compromise out in front of the courts because the courts really don't want us there. And they are the first to tell us that, and they're the first to say, you know, you can provide a fair system. The, uh, the statutes allow us, the uh, case law supports that very concept that basically right in the some of the most major cases involved in this is, you know, courts really don't have time with county matters, and county matters can handle their own matters through some other system besides using the court system. And it's really much more efficient, uh, much more, I would say equitable, but a much more consistent manner of handling these things. Because every time you go over there, a judge doesn't know what the planning department works and how they operate, and what, are, what kind of permit they're going to have. And a hearings officer, uh, having that kind of experience and, and knowing the system, uh, will understand, uh, you know, the timelines that are required for someone to get a septic permit and to get a septic system in. Uh, and it's as simple as that, but it's as problematic uh, for the court to get these kinds of issues squared away and, and us to be wasting money and time on it. And Haley, the question is, uh, when a fine is assessed by circuit court, how much of that comes back to the county now? Uh, we figure on a $100 fine, uh, about a little less than $25. Yeah, that's a pretty low yield. And the, yeah. we hardly ever get $100. Well, we get $100 fines or $200 fines uh, occasionally. Right. But uh, more often than not, we just uh, forgive it after, you know, because we just don't want to have to go in front of the court one more time or what have you. And so the circuit court keeps that money, basically. The, the yeah. state keeps the money. So that's Gene, the Gene, there's where some of the savings come. We, actually keep the money that's being assessed in these fines and we wouldn't otherwise. I think it's a very costly process for the county taxpayers right now. I think this just simplifies it. But Gene, you got any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we get an answer very quickly? Can I come back next week on this after I read it and study it a little bit? Well, we've, we've had uh, public hearing okay. on this before, so we are making a decision okay. on this. Well, it just sounds to me that we're adding another level of uh, bureaucracy. It also sounds like it is cutting the citizens out from their right to go to the actual circuit court. Um, no. It just looks like it's good for the county and not so good for them. Oh, no, you can still appeal it. You can still appeal it. You can still oh, yeah. appeal oh, yeah. it. Sure. You always Great. have the appeal process. Yeah. There's an appeal process, yeah. and everything is associated with this is associated so that there's not just the hearing officer, but also involved in this process in which there's a hearing provided for the evidence that you're allowed and the appeal for that. You don't like the decision. Right. I, I just want to make a comment about this and the qualifications of the person who is a hearings officer and admittedly by judges. And I, I'll give you an example. One time I was in a small claims court and, and listening to a judge make a decision on an issue he had no idea, no, no knowledge about at all, but he made a decision. Afterwards, we said, what, how, how did you qualify yourself to make that decision? He was asked, and he says, I make decisions on false teeth issues, dental things all, all the time, I, and I have to make the decision. I don't know anything about it, but I make the decision on my best judgment. Land use hearings are complicated, and people who make the decisions based on what the code compliance regulations are, the existing rules, regulations, and those need, people need to understand those, and that hearings officer hopefully will be very qualified to make those decisions based on the laws that exist today. So that's, in my estimation, it's the more fair way even to the person who may have a code compliance issue. But anyone else wish to speak? Seeing no one rushing up here, um, we'll go ahead and uh, close the public hearing. Either one of you have any comments you'd like to make? No. Well, just uh, that we do have a hearings officer that does land use hearings. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I remember back uh, in the days when we used to do all the land use hearings, it, uh, I think people are better served by having somebody who is very well versed in the law and uh, it takes it out of a, a political arena to have a hearings officer hear those. We've, uh, we've had just a uh, remarkable response and success with the hearings officer we have for land use hearings and uh, I'm anticipating the same thing with, with this hearings officer. We might add uh, is that we are, you know, the, the code compliance issues, whether it's state or local, exist today. That person makes these decisions on those regulations, those code compliances today. If you really have an interest or feel like and you want those changed, we're writing a brand new land development ordinance package. And if you really have those concerns about whether code compliances should exist or not on the county level, I would hope that you'll fill this courthouse when we start getting into the public hearings uh, that will be starting here sometime a little later this year. So, anyway, I did a team one. Well, we're, re we're required to, uh, to have certain kinds of regulation by the state, and it isn't mm -hmm. fair to people who choose to comply to everything and obey the law to have a bunch of people out there who just flat refuse to obey the law. It just is not a fair system that way either. Mr. Chair, I move that we... Oh, what's the number of the ordinance? It is item 302 and 2003. Oh, here we go. Uh, Mr. Chair, I move that we adopt ordinance 2003-5 um, BL number 8491 in the matter of adding Chapter 294 to the codified ordinances of Jackson County, making provisions for a county hearings officer. As amended today. And then you'll have to read this amendment. As, yeah. As amended, uh, adding the language uh, or any other lawful method to enforce such an order. No second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Yes. 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 That concludes our public hearing portion of our board meeting. Good morning. Good morning. Kurt Chancellor, how are you today? Good. I have some questions. Uh, well, a couple of comments and some questions. One, the comment on uh, uh, the responsibility and uh, the liability that was laid on some of the people that violate uh, the uh, uh, rules that you were just talking about. I find it interesting. I've looked everywhere for years, and I've never found where anybody with government was responsible for anything. And the people that decide that, Pierce versus Ray for the judges, Imler versus Passman for the district attorneys, and uh, Briscoe versus LaHue for the police officers pretty much uh, covers everybody that's going to make any decisions on any of that anyway. They have immunity on everything. As for the library, I find it interesting. We're concerned about that. 113000 went to uh, an artist not from our area to get rocks from Minnesota, not from our area, that was traveled back to inspect those rocks. Uh, we have 113,000 for that. I, uh, all of those things make me wonder. But what makes me wonder more is this adding chapter 294 to uh, uh, our ordinances. This uh, looks to me, and everyone who's looked at it, we've made 30 copies of this and sent it all over the state. You want to bring us up to date on what? Chapter 294 is? Well, it's, uh, you're right, Jack, I'm a little uh, off this morning. In the matter of adding uh, codified ordinances, Jackson County make the provisions for a county hearing officer. Now, I've looked through this, and I'm no expert, but we've showed this to some people that are, and uh, what we've created is a court here. It's not a hearings officer, it's a court. And uh, we're giving him sweeping powers that uh, looks like that uh, he can come into your place, he can do anything he wants. We've taken us out of a court right now, the, the uh, circuit court, and taking this into a hearing officer that will give us uh, several different options of, uh, of uh, are taken away from us. One, if we're not happy with the, the decision of the hearings officer, we have to go back to circuit court and pay 160 bucks to get back into the court. Uh, two, we're given uh, hearings officers sweeping powers that I don't think the Constitution uh, allows. And uh, I think there needs to be, uh, I would like to see more how we came up with this and these statutes. I, uh, 
I, there's already grumblings of uh, people going to uh, to court over this uh, to try to get an injunction to stop it. So I, I don't understand how we got to this point. It looks pretty uh, pretty uh, sweeping to me, the powers that are given to this hearings office. And I would like to know more about it. I don't know if, uh, if we're entitled to something from the administrator's office or the county council's office. It shows how we got to this. This this is incredible. Craig, I have to ask you. Uh, yes, sir. You saying sweeping powers? Sweeping powers, in my estimation, by any hearings officer is based on uh, their ability to reflect what is the law in regards to land use issues, mm -hmm. and those can change. But no matter what, they can't uh, interpret something that is not the law and and what and you know my efforts to try to simplify land use ordinances in Jackson County and the state and getting a good interpretation of what they are is going to make that uh, a better easier process to understand by any hearings officer in the future and so I guess broad sweeping ability to to do something outside of the, the guidelines of the law I don't I don't see where that well, well, that's going to happen. Well, Jack, I, one of the things is uh, the hearings officer shall have uh, authority to adjudicate all county violations with the power to impose civil and criminal remedies. That sounds like something that a judge does, not a hearings officer. Uh, we, we've got them here uh, deemed necessary or appropriate to enter authorized county personnel or their designees to enter upon premises of any person or any business found to be out of compliance. Uh, I, I just... You know, we, we went down a slippery road when we uh, started with the dog uh, uh, ordinances on being able to let uh, uh, people from that department go on the property to, for matters that they felt were an emergency at the time. When exigent circumstances existed, they had the right to go anyway. I mean, there's, there's so many things here that bother myself, but what bothers me worse is there's some people a lot smarter than I am that it bothers about it. And I would like to find out more how how we how we got to this. Uh, uh, where that a power says that we have constitutional and statutory power. I would like to know what that was based on, and I'd like to know where I would get that information. I'd like to look at this a little further before I uh, sign off on it. Well, I, I think you and I could have many discussions on this, and I'm sure Dave would too. But I think based on what we approved, mm -hmm. uh, if there's something in that that is proven to be in a violation of, of the rights of the public, constitutional rights or whatever, I think that can be, um, that certainly ought to be looked at. But I think we have, we have done that very clearly in a process before we approved it. And I think our main goal in all of this is to expedite, clarify, the process that people have to go through when they make applications mainly for developing or building on their lands. And if they're in code compliance and they have violated present law, how to get that determined on a fair basis. And I think that's been our main goal. And, and we can question and challenge virtually everything that, that anybody ever develops in laws. Um, but. You know, I, I don't see that we've done anything outside of the realm of trying to make it a simpler process. If you can, if you can find a way, I'd, I'd, I'd sit down and talk to you about what we did wrong. Jack, I, I think, I mean, overall, uh, you know, I think it's, hearings officer is probably a good concept. I think one place uh, that we might be able to uh, uh, <coughs> alleviate some of the concerns that Kurt had, uh, there may need to have uh, intermediary between the hearings officer in the circuit court, and that's probably a proper role for the Board of Commissioners. Uh, and it may be uh, worthwhile maybe even sticking that in somehow where uh, an appeal could be made to us first, and then if, if they're still unsatisfied, the person's still not satisfied, to go on to the circuit court. Uh, and that, that might be something that would be helpful for us. And that's just throwing that out as an idea. Well, it's my understanding that county courts and district courts were, were abolished and circuit courts, so we would have an even uh, handed to justice throughout our state, and I'm really curious why we're why we're circumventing circuit court. That's where we go now. We got yeah, the decisions well, made. But, but I'm going to tell you, when you're looking at the budget uh, crisis and that the state says they have in dealing with courts right now, 
uh, they're talking about eliminating one more day uh, of the week from even hearing cases. And when you start talking about land use issues, and you can simplify that process by having someone that you can easily access and, and get a decision made, I'm not sure why you'd be uh, opposing something that makes it a simple process compared to getting it on the docket of, of the court over here when they're eliminating judges uh, or positions in full days of hearing cases. How do you justify that? Well, there's a reason that the Constitution guarantees it's a court of record, Jack. But you still have the right, if you're not satisfied with the decision by the hearings officer, to go to that if you feel it's necessary to do that. But why should I have to try it twice? I have the right to go to the court now. Yeah, I mean, I'm only going to just tell you, you, you can certainly bypass the hearings officer process Right. right off the bat, if you don't think that you're going to get a fair uh, hearing, you do have the right to say, no, I demand it heard in court, and you could do that. But do I have to pay for that? Well, you, you do now. No, when I when you cite me into that court, I don't have to pay that well, filing fee. That's 160 bucks. Every time this profit center across the street, the municipal court, it's not a court of record. Anytime you want to appeal anything that they've done, you have to uh, pay that fee. You know, I, I'm, I guess I would have to ask the question, why would we be forcing someone to go through the normal process of acquiring a decision in, in justice court? Why would we be having a $160 yeah, filing fee? 63 filing to get That's in. not something we'd be dealing with, and I, I don't remember that being in there. I, I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. But it's because no matter idea. what, decisions made on any kind of level below that, you always have a right to go to court. Well, I love options. But why would we, why would we be, I don't know how we could force a cost to you going into the civil court. Well, when you're cited by a city police officer in the municipal court, uh, if you want to appeal to the other court, you have to pay, pay for that. You have to go to circuit court. You just don't get an automatic appeal to it. We have an automatic right to an appeal, but you have to file for it. But, right now, but, if county signs we just, go to circuit But you just answered your own question. If you decide you want to take it to court and not go to before the hearings officer, that's a decision you can make without having to ever go before a hearings officer. Okay, as long as it don't have but to But that's pay not for a cost to you. If you go through the hearings officer, then there is a cost mm -hmm. that uh, we have to make up by paying that hearings officer in one manner or another. And so, yeah, if you decide to go to the hearings officer first, then there could be a charge because somebody's got to pay for that hearings officer. That $160 charge, if that's correct, would not be the charge it would be forced on you to go to a, a higher court. Right. So, well, the main thing I wanted to do was find out more about it. I, uh, I, I, the only way that, uh, I, that I see that you guys are going to find out a lot about it is just file an injunction uh, to stop it and then uh, let, the, let them fight it out. But what we're going to be doing is loading up those same guys that we got if we're trying to take a burden off of would be circuit court. And then the thing's going to be tied up until who knows when. I'm for uh, making things faster and more efficient, uh, there's no question about that, but not at the uh, risk of giving up uh, any rights or giving powers uh, to uh, any uh, public servant. Well, it's really interesting uh, being you brought up the courts is that we added one, uh, one judge and we took away, supposedly, uh, wanting to take away one day. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense no, to add doesn't. one judge and take away a day that they can even hear. don't quite understand that, but... True story. Uh, is there, now can I, uh, I'd like to find out more about this. Uh, you know, I forgot to set your clock. That's all right. You're, you're done. I'm done anyway. <laughs> Did, uh, 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 who, who would I see? Sue or Mike or for more information about this? You well, sorry, Mr. Chair, this, is, this, this, this is, is, it's been on for oh. you twice. It's been on your Well, let's just do it. Let's just do it in court. That would be the easiest we, thing to do. Thank you. I think it's legal and sufficient. If anybody wants to challenge it, we're welcome. Yeah. I mean, Standing I'm, up in court, you can serve the papers on me. Thanks. All right. Anyone else wishing to speak? No one's jumping up. Yes, there is. Your <laughs> Jean Wallman, Eagle Point. Um, my question is now: This hearings officer is only for land use, or are they going to hear other things within the county? Well, actually, there would be other things. Uh, it's code enforcement. It's contemplated for code enforcement, animal control. You know, we don't have a very large number of them, but restaurant violations. Okay, are we going to have a hearings officer for each area? No. Okay, we already have one for land use because mm -hmm. I came before him. So why 
Are we just legitimizing his job, or? No, we're, we did not have authority for the hearings officer to hear the kinds of cases, the animal control, code enforcement, restaurant violations before. I believe we had to to create the hearings officer authority in the land use matters. Did you do that? It way predated me, I don't know. Okay, so we're already paying a land use hearings officer. Right, and we're paying him to do land use hearings. He is working full time. We anticipate he will not be able to fit this into his schedule and that there will be so we're going to other add appointed hearings one. officers. And as we talk to you about at the public hearing, uh, we expect that the cost of the hearings officer will be paid for in the filing fees for um, the hearings officer work. So okay, so there's two, going to be three, a filing four, fee? They're, they're paid for. That's there. in the fine structure. I keep calling it filing fee, but it's in oh, the fine structure. Yeah. Yeah. So the only way we can keep this guy is if he really goes in and finds a lot of people. If it doesn't pay for itself, as we said at the public hearing as well, we'll revert back to the uh, circuit court system whereby we don't get very consistent findings and we don't frankly we're just not high on their priority list, and I certainly understand that. Well, I think it's a good thing to bring this out of out of that, as long as we do it within the judicial rules and regulations. I do not see a hearing officer that is not elected by the people as being fair to the people, because he's basically a county employee. Will guess he's what? Not a county employee. He's an even be Who pays him? He's paid by county budget, but and the we do not look at his decisions. He makes his decisions on his own. <laughs> this is a real yeah, fine yeah, point here. We're going to pay him, but he's not a county employee. That is exactly the process we've had yeah. in place for a number of years with our hearings officer for land use issues. Okay, right there. We already have a land use person who is being paid by the county. We're going to add another one, I take it. Is that all? I mean, how many are we budgeting here for? One, two, three? This is a work in progress. We don't know how heavy the workload will be, but we will have hearings officers to serve the workload, and that's it. Okay, so we and agree. it's not going to cover its own one. expenses. Then it comes back yeah, before this bad. board as a decision mm -hmm. whether we want to continue. How quickly are we going to get into them paying for themselves because obviously we're going to have to pay. We have some startup costs. I would give it yeah. several months or a year before we could figure that out. Okay. Where can we go for this information? It's office, all in the certainly. ordinance, all of the costs, okay. all Could of I get the, a copy uh, of that? Because I have been missing a few meetings, so I'd like to. Certainly. If you'll stop by our office, we'll be happy to give that to you. Jean, if I Thank remember you. right, you were here during that public hearing. She testified. Though. Yeah, yes, you, on, you on the last that? one. I wasn't here for the first one. There was only one public hearing. Okay, and then it would just put through. But see, I got I hit that one and just got up and spoke, but I did not have any time to go back through it and, and really read it. So I feel that I am kind of behind the eight. We spent there. all of our time before we uh, before we approved it. <laughs> yeah, well, I had time since. now I'd like to look at it from my side. So, okay, I'll be All in right. your office, Sue. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. Anyone else wishing to speak? I'm not giving anybody else a chance to jump up real quick. Uh, no one's uh, no one's approaching the podium. Uh, we'll go ahead and close this meeting. Uh, thank you all for being here. We will see you next Wednesday morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I uh, brought up the other day when I was here uh, the uh, codified ordinances of Jackson County and adding uh, Chapter 294 to those on a hearings officer. Uh, since uh, County Council was less than responsive when I was here about what that entitled and he wanted, uh, thought it had been heard enough and didn't want to discuss it. We've been looking into it and we have went through everything we can find on your charter. You can't find anything in that charter that entitles you to create a court. We've looked at all the ORSs on hearings, on hearings officers, all the definition from blacks all the way through. We can't find anything that a hearings officer can do but to hear things. 
can't rule on them. He can't make decisions in a court-like manner. Uh, we have uh, administration that looks like it's encroaching on the judiciary. I think you've got some uh, problems of separation of powers. Uh, I can't find anything that gives you guys the right to do that. And I'm hoping that you'll, uh, you'll reconsider this before this is put into effect. Um, I also realize and understand that with money being the way it is right now, counties all over. I mean, we know that administrators would pull the pennies off of a dead taxpayer's eyes if they had to, if they could get 50% of it their CAFRs and the rest of it in the general fund. We know that. We understand it. We're doing the same thing at home, trying to meet our obligations. And so we expect that. But you have not only an obligation, but a duty to prevent these things from happening to us. And as far as counsel, I mean, that goes without saying. They're attorneys. Uh, we know what, what uh, their job is to do. It's to money, to deny. It's tough when we're taxpayers to have to pay for your attorneys through our taxes and then pay for ours to try to prevent you from doing the things you're doing. Now, this particular issue I've paid more attention to than any single thing I've ever looked at and are continuing to, to a lot of other people are. I hope you'll take another look at this. I'm reminded by these things. I look at it as an invasion of rights. It doesn't have anything to do with money as far as I'm concerned. It has to do with rights. And uh, I just don't think that that right exists, either constitutionally uh, or uh, through our uh, statutory authority. But uh, that remains to be seen and determined in our future. Uh, however, uh, I'm reminded by watching the news over the last few days, it's really funny. It's not funny, it's actually sad. We have men and women going over in another country, giving their lives up to try to give them the same rights we have, while right here in our own community, we have people struggling to take those rights away from us. And uh, I would, like I said, I hope you'll think about it again, and I'd be Glad to hear anything that you have to say from my seat. Thank you. Okay. Do we have any answer to well, Mr. Chancellor? I mean, I, for 60 I, I'm not years, sure that it, you know, in the United States, at every level of government, there have been hearings officers making quasi-judicial decisions that are appealable to court. It's been challenged at every level, in every form, and consistently held to be constitutional. There's nothing constitutionally offensive about having a hearings officer. That's just, you know, I'm sorry, it's just that simple. But, you know, if the board wants me to develop a, a treatise, you know, and educate these folks, I'll be glad to do it. But, you know, I'm pretty busy, and uh, it's your decision on how you want to allocate the well, well, the questions of the legality, uh, Mike, has already been asked way prior to us ever putting this uh, before uh, this board as, as to be approved. That has already been questioned. And uh, we have been assured that it is legal. It has taken place, and like he says, virtually every county in this uh, state has the right to do it. Some have. Um, and I, I think if we have to follow our legal counsel and their, their direction, that's who we're going to follow. So, I mean, if there's, a, you know, we have to answer to anything that we might. Uh, do illegally, and uh, it can be challenged by the public in any manner whatsoever. So certainly the opportunity is there if the public wishes to challenge our legal or our legal right to do that. But as it stands right now, we feel that that's the best process for us to get through some of uh, the obligations that we think this county has when it comes to land use uh, regulations, rights, uh, uh, and that's that's the way we're going to do it until until we find that we are violating some law. And right now I don't don't think that's that's taking place. So we that's, appreciate your comments. So. The, the other side of that coin, uh, there are literally thousands of people in Jackson County who make it a point to come down, they get permits, they go through the whole process of uh, our zoning and regulation. And a lot of it's far more onerous than that we even hmm? would like. You know, it's, uh, it's a lot of detail and everything, but there are a lot of people who take the time and trouble to actually go through this process. And then there's an element of fairness when people choose not to go through correct processes. There's, a, there's an element of fairness if people decide to uh, do something that detracts from other people's property in a very significant way or creates a health hazard. 
And so uh, I think we have some kind of an obligation to also protect the people who have invested in property, who uh, want some kind of predictability in their community, and uh, who do obey the laws and, and do everything according to the book. So that's the other side of the coin. And I think it's always difficult for us to sort of balance between what is allowed on property and what clearly where you step over the line and, and you do something that uh, is against the law and, uh, or violates some of, some of the things that we have here in Jackson County. So I, I think it's constantly an argument that people have about, uh, about all of these code compliance issues. And uh, I don't deny that a lot of times I see the other side, you know, as well. And, but if we have a law in the books, then we have to have some way of enforcing it. And the hearings officer is a very equitable, good way of doing that to get everybody's voice heard. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, people have a right to get a timely resolution of disputes, too. Uh, and the other problem we have is with the present circuit courts uh, and their schedules being pulled back, uh, if to uh, appeal to a circuit court at this stage would take many, many months and people wouldn't get resolution for a long time. Uh, this would expedite that. Uh, and I understand your concerns, Kirk, but I think this, at this point that seems to be the most timely way of doing it and, and letting people get, their, uh, uh, get some resolution early rather than waiting months and months and months. Uh, people deserve that. Well, I think right now, uh, I find it this kind of an unfortunate time uh, for, for these kind of comments to be made because, I, as Kurt well knows, uh, we are in the middle of, of creating a, one of the most understandable, simplistic uh, land development ordinance packages this county has ever had. Hopefully, he will participate, and those of you who have... Uh, concerns about your rights as property owners will participate in the process of putting together our new LDO and our comp plan. Uh, those are going to start hearings in June and July. So uh, we're trying to make it simple, uh, very simple, easy to understand, and maybe even e easier for a hearings officer to decide what the meaning of land regulations in this county uh, were meant by when this board adopts them. So, uh, Anyway, I think we're doing the right thing. We're going to continue, and we'll hope that all of you participate in that process. Anyone else wishing to speak? Mr. Chair, may I say one more thing to Kurt? Sure. I did get your letter. Uh, you asked for some specific information about rates and so on. I'll try and get that for you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. morning. Um, my name is Larry Redler. I haven't been here for quite a while, but it's just like I took a piece out of time and came back, and it's just a, con a continuum. There's this man here for seven years. I mean, that is ridiculous that that can't be resolved. Sue, you told that some of these regulations are onerous. Uh, why don't we do something about it? We are. Well, it, it just seems like, I mean, your people are going to Reno. You know, you're, whenever I see, Sue, whenever I see people, when you people are going to Reno or all these, um, meetings, it's how much money is going to be for the county, for the county. I have a friend who puts up a lot of buildings. His building permits are a dollar a square foot. For Where is he putting them up, Larry? What's that? Is in he the putting county. them up in the city or in the county? In the county. They're a dollar a square foot for the, the building itself, just the system development fees, and this guy develops the whole land, which was basically just open space land, and the offices are $2 a square foot. This doesn't reflect the actual cost to the county and actually acts as an encumbrance to people building. Um, uh, in other words, the more cost is involved in getting something, getting a business started, that's the less business money that the person has for expanding the business and also for paying wages. Larry, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Who would you expect to pay for the cost of Streets, curbs, gutters, sewer, uh, electrical hookups, uh, all of those systems that enable uh, those buildings to operate after they're built. Who would, who would you expect to pay for those costs? You think somebody in Butte Falls, uh, who is a property taxpayer, should they pay for the development 
of private commercial development and the systems development that goes with it? That's exactly what I'm getting at, Jack. These system development fees are not reflective of, of things that are um, affected in the general area of where the person's business are. They're, they go into the general fund. They don't go for system oh, no. development. No, they don't. They're directly for capital improvements on roads. I helped pass that. I know. But what you've done is, it's just like this $20 million. If you've got $20 million from the state, if you've got $20 million from the federal government, that would go into the general fund and wouldn't reduce any of those system development fees. They're for other, they're for, for um, encouraging this burgeoning bureaucracy. I mean, we have uh, larger and larger governments that are more oppressive. It, uh, are you, you're familiar with these system development fees. Oh, of course. I mean, they, they I, 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 the way I look at it, if I, if I build me a, a commercial building, and uh, well, it's I, also, I know that it is my responsibility to pay for the road that gets there, the curbs that provide access to my business, uh, the cost for sewer and water hookups. Uh, I expect that I'm going to pay that cost, and then I'm going to incorporate that cost in my, uh, my operation of that commercial development. And I, I can tell you that the people who are building these commercial buildings and who are renting or leasing those buildings, they are transferring that cost for that SDC charge into their cost of renting or leasing. They would not be building those buildings and, and continue to build them unless they have those people willing to pay the cost for leasing them. I mean, they can't be, they can't, Jack, they can't exactly. be investing in them so without So what you have done is you have taken the business community and, and use them as a surrogate for collecting your taxes. But these, these taxes are, I guess, the systems development charge goes directly to building capacity in the roads to handle the extra traffic that the new business will create. So what it, what it is applied to, it's very specific, but Good morning. Uh, welcome to the regular Wednesday 9.30 board meeting. It is April 9th, 2003. If I could ask all of you to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and then remain standing if you would. You want to lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Dear Lord, I am more proud than ever to be an American, and uh, after watching uh, what's happening in, in this war in Iraq, it makes you realize how proud we should all be uh, Americans. I watched uh, this morning as we see uh, Iraq being liberated, and uh, I think there's times when you when you see other countries and you see what we have in this country. It's, it's time for all of us to uh, understand how very, very fortunate we are. I, I was also pray that you protect our American soldiers and the Iraqi people. I think uh, this is a time that we ought to all be looking at uh, what is not only best for our own armed forces, but the, uh, the people of that country that will need all of our help and uh, your help in protection in the future. Thank you. Yeah. The policies of the past are in need of modifying. This modification will be difficult as the emotional nature involved runs deep in both the Democratic and Republican parties. The issue has separated the parties in a battle characterized as big business versus environmental policy. There is balance to be had. Policy has swung the pendulum from one extreme to the other. The loser in this battle is the environment itself. This last summer, Oregon was ground zero for catastrophic wildfires. 
The Biscuit Fire alone consumed a half a million acres, and with it, critical habitat for endangered species, streams and riparian areas, and billions of board feet of timber. We can continue the pitch battles of the past while our forests suffer the results of a century of neglect, underinvestment, and mismanagement, some of it with the best of intentions. Without a substantial shift in forest management policy, such catastrophes will become routine. We'll spend billions of dollars fighting fires and hundreds of millions more repairing the damage they do. This is the price of inaction, and we can no longer afford to pay it. Or we can show we have the vision and fortitude to implement needed changes, to put in place a long-term, sustainable, scientifically based, environmentally responsible new forest policy. There's way too many trees per acre. This causes the trees to be weakened because they're competing for available soil moisture, nutrients, and sunlight with the rest of the trees. They uh, cannot warrant off insect attacks. Uh, they succumb to many pathogens. And as a result, wildfire comes through here. And it's very hard to control a wildfire when you have such a, a catastrophic event occurring with so much fuel loading. Probably managed forests, we thin them down to a more natural condition towards pre-European settlement where the trees were scattered and uh, less dense than they are today. And consequently, the trees are much healthier. They're more vigorous, they're faster growing, they warrant off insects and diseases, and they're much better able to withstand a catastrophic wildfire. Right now, a big concern to society is the fire suppression, you know, because it's a cost, it's a danger. You know, but I think that there's a, a lot of biological uh, reasons why we should enter forests and, and work them so they become more resilient. You know, because if we, if we don't, if we, we have suppressed, we have impacted the diversity, we have impacted the resiliency of the ecosystem. And so we have to remedy, by just letting it go, we're not remedying it. Oregon grows 9 billion board feet of timber a year. 2 billion feet of that is grown on lands that are legislatively withdrawn, they're not available for harvest, which leaves 7 billion board feet. The Oregon timber industry currently operates on 3.5 billion board feet, and the other 3.5 billion board feet is not being used, and it's being put on timber through growth and many of those stands are becoming overstocked. Oregon has a choice. Do they want to use that three and a half billion feet, or do they want to continue to let their timber become overstocked over time? In Jackson County, we have about 80% of our land mass is forested, and 50% is federal forest. And of course, people move to Jackson County because they want to enjoy the forest. They want to live near the forest. So we have more interface and people living near forests than any other county in Oregon. We also have the problems that go with that. And that is that it impacts our forest management and it also creates a problem with forest fire. The uses of our natural resources have an almost limitless potential and the forests of the Pacific Northwest are no exception. People vacation and spend a great deal of time in the outdoors. Hunting and fishing are just some of the ways individuals commune with nature. The forests of the Pacific Northwest are a vital part of people's everyday existence and provide an irreplaceable location for the recreational needs of our society. Land is owned by either the federal government because it was never deeded to a private individual in past history, or it's owned by private individuals and private companies today. In Oregon, more specifically in Jackson County, two thirds of the land is owned, still owned by the federal government that has forests on it, and one third is owned by private individuals. In Southern Oregon, because the federal government has harvested less 
something over history than the private lands have. Three-fourths of the treaty volume is on federal lands and about one-fourth is on private land. That's why federal lands need to be considered as well as private lands when you think about the forests of Oregon. We have choices in managing our forests. Choices to a point that we have catastrophic fire. Once catastrophic fire comes in, those choices go away. But until that day comes, in a stand like this, we could have done some thinning. We could have come in and removed some of the trees and allowed growth to be put on remaining trees. By, remaining, by removing the trees, we would have reduced the fire hazard. We create lots of flexibility for future choices. We could have allowed natural processes to come in and had natural fire come in and do the pruning, do the stem removal, do the things that a forest normally does. But over the course of 100 years of fire suppression, we've allowed growth to become overstocking. And once that occurs, then we put these stands at a great peril. If you're going to do any commodity salvaging of fire-filled timber, you have to do it very quickly because it deteriorates much more rapidly than, than timber that you would, you would saw down for, uh, to make lumber. Conversion to agriculture and, and uh, poor land use practices in many of the developing parts of the world uh, have the result that a, an area of forest about equal to the entire area of Oregon's forest is being converted to non-forest uses worldwide every year. So we have some strategic choices that we're going to have to make globally, nationally, and locally about how to sustain the forest for all the values that we, that we need to have from those forests. And to me, those choices uh, fall down into four general uh, categories. One is how we manage the forests. Two is the environmental standards that we apply to all of our forest practices. Three is well, how we behave as consumers. The U.S. is, not surprisingly, the largest per capita user of wood and water anywhere in the world. And then the fourth is how to rebuild the common ground uh, around uh, natural resource practices so that we can uh, get past the conflict culture that has uh, had such a negative economic impact on our ability to do good forest stewardship and keep our, our, our rural communities and, and their economies healthy. 1,900 employees were lost and 20 mills closed in the Jackson Josephine County area since 1989. If only a portion of those could return, and even a portion of the employees could be brought back, uh, the wealth created from utilizing this fantastic asset that we have all around us and which is renewable would certainly result in positive economic activity. I think the biggest thing that we have to understand when we're talking about uh, timber salvage uh, in the Northwest or in Oregon is, is that um, the environmental requirements for us to cut timber in the Northwest in the state of Oregon, if, if it's not harvested in, in the United States or in Northwest uh, United States, then those environmental uh, requirements probably are not followed in other parts of the world. So not only the, the benefits uh, that that we have by having a viable timber industry uh, here is, is that those environmental issues are dealt with here in the United States. When you lose family wage jobs, uh, which are jobs that pay 12, 14, 15 bucks an hour, there is a trickle down where it hurts other industries where they don't buy cars, they don't buy uh, furniture, they don't buy clothes, which affects us and our members in that our members basically bring in those items. So it affects our uh, members quite a bit. In searching through the various options of a balanced change, 
It's difficult to find that one recommendation that will satisfy all parties involved. But perhaps it's not one single example, but a combination of ideas that will, in the end, create a lasting change. Let's just look at an example of what a change in forest policies would have on the economy, living wage jobs, and the government's budget. Presently in the state of Oregon, there's 9 billion board feet of timber grown naturally. Out of that 9 billion board feet, presently 3.5 billion are being harvested. That 3.5 billion translates to 75,000 jobs provided to Oregonians. And that 75,000 jobs translates to $5 billion worth of payroll. Translating, again, 9% state income tax, that, that uh, ends up being $450 million directly towards the state budget. So doubling that 3.5, creating 7 billion board feet, would translate to another $450 million, which would mean $900 million of economic input to the state budget. If the Northwest Forest Plan had been implemented and had uh, produced uh, or had achieved the, the targets in the plan, I think we would have been much better off in the last 10 years. It, it would have certainly had a dampening effect on the current recession that is occurring in Oregon, and it would have uh, provided far more income to the counties than they're currently getting, because there are, the timber harvest is only 20% of the target that was envisioned in the Northwest Forest Plan. We have the best of all possible worlds in that we can grow trees as well as anybody in the world, and when we cut them and use them for products, we can also replant, and we do. And so I think that, uh, that being surrounded with this renewable resource is really a great advantage. I think the salvage logging is, is very important uh, for us, not only uh, to the value uh, that it exists, uh, there, but uh, what it translates into later on in uh, at the environment. The environment recuperates and recovers a lot faster if it's uh, done through harvesting than it does on a natural basis, and, and that's very important to us, that we ought to get a, a good quick head start on it. The private timber industry seem to do it better than we do. Wildlife depend on a wide variety of habitats in which to survive. Some animals prefer old growth. Uh, there are a lot of animals that require open space in which to live. Most of our ungulate population, that's deer, elk, uh, and lar larger other animals termed big game, bear, cougar, need a variety of habitat that includes sometimes old growth, but more than not, open plains, meadows, clear cuts, uh, uh, disturbed lands in which to forage and, and find food for survival. It's time to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Our renewed policy will be challenged by some and embraced by others. It will end the pendulum swinging policies of the past. It will create a healthy environment for wildlife, cleaner air and water, revenue and funding, jobs and safety. If we address this issue with bipartisanship and vision, we can create a policy that makes sense. Not one of destroying wildlife habitat and neglecting the human need, but one of management and balance. This video will be supplied to forest communities throughout the country, state and federal legislators, BLM and U.S. Forest Service personnel, county government decision makers, and environmental interest groups. Its intent is to begin a grassroots effort to create a policy that makes sense. One that creates healthy forests, clean air and water, economic balance, fire suppression, alternative funding for government, and improved habitat for deer, elk, salmon, and spotted owls. A policy with vision and compassion. One that can gain support by all parties involved.
want to thank you uh, for watching this. And, uh, I think that our certainly our intentions in putting this video together was is to, just as the video says, approaching a common sense uh, policy towards dealing with our natural resource. And I have to tell you that those who have seen it, uh, we have certainly had some negatives to it uh, that, we, that we put the video together, but we've certainly had no negatives to the contents of the video because I don't think you could. Um, I think that what we tried to accomplish, we did. I think it was done the best we know how. And uh, hopefully uh, we will get enough uh, of our state legislators and our federal representatives to pay attention to that and uh, our efforts in the future to, uh, again, take a good common sense policy towards a natural resource and harvesting some of the salvage from fires that uh, seem to just uh, be sitting there waiting to rot and do no one uh, any any good. Uh, either one of you have a comment? Would you like to make another video? We'll then go into our uh, normal board meeting. Item 4009's an ordinance, uh, also on its first reading, an ordinance amending section 294.02 of the codified ordinances of Jackson County to remove the phrase state law and to re-index section on its first reading and setting the second reading in public hearing also for April 23rd, 2003 at 2 p.m. in this courthouse auditorium. So, Mr. Chair, this is a very minor change to our hearings officer ordinance and the author is here for a brief explanation. Doug, you want to go ahead and do that? I know it does sound uh, a little strange, re-index section. Yes, yeah, so basically all that is is just a typo that I that I noticed when I was going through the the more substantive change, which is the uh, changing of the of the wording uh, to remove the uh, the just a single phrase of state laws. I, as much as I tried, I tried to make it exactly perfect when I brought it to you the first time, and I did have a call, phone call from. Uh, from a local attorney that was representing the ACLU and was concerned about, about the hearings officer uh, um, ordinance. And uh, so after we discussed it for some time, he called his people and he said, you know, came back and said, you know what, you're right, everything's just fine, except there's one little thing. He says, uh, the point is that, uh, and it's true, our intent is to uh, have a hearings officer who have jurisdiction over county matters and of, of county concerns and you had in here something here that refers to state laws. And I looked and I said, oop, you're right. Um, in, my, in my eagerness to, uh, to include, I, I, I must have uh, just missed this one. And, uh, and I, I saw that it did say state laws. I agreed with them. And uh, it's not a matter, it's, it's not something that the hearings officer would have jurisdiction over. It has no intent to do that. So removing that just eliminates that, that, that uh, possibility. Uh, if there are some things in state law, it doesn't mean that the county couldn't adopt them like, like we do, for instance, the uh, building codes and stuff. But um, in this case, if it's a state law and our county doesn't have an ordinance that, that deals with that, then that's not something we would be handling in, in a uh, even, though our, even though our ordinances would automatically have in the adoption any state, state requirements eliminating the state law, that's just correct, that, right? That. This is, and it's just, um, it was really more, almost in the preamble as opposed to anything else. It's the only I looked all the way through everywhere else, and there's no other place do we ever, do I ever put in there uh, uh, anything that would uh, somehow uh, involve a state law uh, issue that we would be dealing with. Yes, I would so, entertain, Mr. Chair. I uh, move that we. Approve the first reading ordinance number 2003-13 in the matter of amending section 294.02 of the codified ordinance of Jackson County to remove the phrase, quote, state law, end of quote, and re-index section. Uh, second reading and public hearing be scheduled for Wednesday, uh, April 23rd, uh, 2003, uh, at 9.30 a.m. Courthouse Auditorium. I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call. Mrs. Capellas? Yes. Dr. Gilmore? Yes. Mr. Walker? Yes. Well, that concludes our regular scheduled meeting. Um, and we will, uh, first of all, ask the board if you have any comments you'd like to make before we open oh. it up to the. Uh, 
Sue, so you have to go. Uh, yeah. yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone in the audience wishing to speak? Uh, we have five minutes allowed. Come on up. Morning, Commissioners. Kurt Chancellor, Central Point. Uh, I uh, salute you on your uh, video. It, uh, I couldn't see anything that I could argue with or anybody else could. I think a healthy economy and a healthy environment and our woods run hand in hand. Uh, uh, I was also glad to see uh, uh, the last ex explanation uh, on uh, codified ordinance uh, 29402, the phrase uh, state law. That's been a concern to us in that ordinance also. Uh, also last week when I was here, Council uh, Mike Jewett uh, brought up that uh, I had some reservations about this law uh, that you're trying to uh, put in ordinance. And he said that quasi-governmental agencies and quasi, so I got looking up quasi, and it's really interesting. We find out that uh, law professors all over think that quasi-judicial body uh, is either Judicial or it's not, that it, it can't be quasi because our rights aren't quasi. And we found out it was really interesting the word quasi looked up means actually, seemingly, but not really, in some sense. I, I find that when we're dealing with rights that are not quasi, our rights aren't quasi. Why do we have quasi remedies dealing with rights that aren't quasi? And can we take, like, to these rights, quasi-rights, quasi-remedies, do we pay for those, those remedies with quasi-money? Or can we have quasi-compliance with the findings of uh, this organization that's uh, quasi? And so quasi, we're looking into that. It's, it's one of those fascinating words, and I'm very curious with these Quasi-judicial uh, refers to administrative tribunals, but it doesn't say anything about our rights being quasi. Only the remedies uh, to problems that come up being quasi. We refer to quasi-judicial, quasi-rights, quasi-power, but our rights are quasi. And I'm really curious how we're coming up with quasi-remedies to rights that are anchored in state constitution, federal constitution, state law, federal law, and rights that are given to us uh, by God Almighty. By the way, it's nice to hear the prayer again. Thank you. And uh, so this quasi thing is really, really bothers me a lot. And uh, uh, I would like to know more about how the word quasi, quasi government, quasi tribunal, how all of these play a role, a serious role, in rights that are not quasi. Uh, these young men and women that are in Iraq right now are not fighting for quasi rights, or quasi remedies to those rights. And uh, I, uh, I would like, I'd like to ask again that the board reconsider before implementing this till. Uh, can be looked at a little stronger. I'll ask again. I'll I might I might respond to, to that when when being asked what quasi judicial decision making includes is that I always remind myself uh, to carry around this little uh, description uh, of of what that really means here when it follows uh, or in regards to state land use regulations mm -hmm. and, and it is uh, listed as. Uh, uh, following elements notice clear and objective decisional criteria an opportunity to be heard a fair and impartial decision maker and that's i think part of what we're trying to accomplish here the right to present evidence in the record a written decision with findings of facts and conclusions which is what we try to come up with and the right to appeal a brief explanation of each element um, that follows. And I carry this because it kind of reminds me of sometimes what we, uh, what we allow in the process of providing government and something that isn't just necessarily black and white 
especially when you have a state that has the, the land use regulation that Oregon does. And I don't know how you would ever get to a decision without having the quasi-judicial process because a lot of it is not clear when it comes down to the county level. We question uh, many times when we're making a decision what is the intentions of the LCD when they force these uh, requirements. We make a decision and many times it gets appealed and they'll tell us, well, how did you, uh, how did you believe or what did you believe uh, the requirements were under that? It's, a, it's, it's vague. And we have to make our decisions based on you know, what we sometimes think is pretty gray, but it could it could be decided really one way or the other. That you have people sitting up here trying to decide uh, what they meant when they when they made those requirements, and most of most of them are administrative rules. Uh, when I went into the city council center point, uh, this came up too, and I was really puzzled by the term quasi myself. Uh, because there, uh, what would happen is you'd have uh, a person who would come before the planning commission and maybe uh, you know, denied uh, uh, whatever they're trying to get, uh, whether it's uh, you know, a partition or whatever. Uh, if, they, if it was denied at the planning commission level, it would go up to the city council. And the city council would have uh, then the ability to either you know, deny the applicant's request or to approve it and override the planning commission. And that was considered quasi-judicial. Uh, and that's a term that's kind of thrown out at that time because it meant that we're doing, acting like a judge even though we weren't a judge. And that's, that's sort of what it meant at that point. I think that's what it means, that you're acting like a judge even though you're not a judge per se, uh, as far as that type of decision making. And I think that's, that's what it means. It's pretty, pretty odd uh, you know, uh, phraseology, but that's something that's, that's been kind of stuck there. We're, you know, we're stuck with it, the cities are stuck with it. I think that the Constitution of the Supreme Court refers to it as vague and ambiguous. It's uh, not to, supposed to be in any legislation or any law. But most of what we do and, here is uh, negative ambiguous. <laughs> well, you know, council there, Doug, uh, he, uh, he doesn't subscribe to private ownership of land anyway. Yeah. And uh, yeah, in our conversations we've had, or the Constitution, or the rights to defend uh, yourself in court, uh, you have no right to a jury trial, as I remember in uh, the uh, uh, Redler case. Uh, you have no right to a jury trial. Uh, that's. Uh, Guaranteed to us the Constitution, but not here. Well, um, got about there's seven, a lot. It's got about seven minutes on there already. <laughs> well, let me you get out of time. Give <laughs> somebody else a chance. Thank okay. you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Now, her, we're only going to get five minutes. I could. <laughs> <laughs> One question. Gene Wallman, Eagle Point. Um, my question is, is if you do not want to go before this, can you go directly to circuit court? Can you be put right in? Now, Jack at one time gave the indication you could, but when I spoke with Mr. McGeary, you could not. I just would like that clarified. Well, let, me, let me clarify, I think, what I said first, and then is if you did, did not like the result of this, of a decision made, then you certainly have the right to take it to whatever level court you want it to. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's the basis. Of it. Uh, you would have to hear it on the lower end because they would not accept it on, in the higher level courts because you didn't go through the process to get there. That's what I needed to know because I understood that we could, at the very beginning, that if we decreed that we would rather go to circuit court than the quasi court, we would have that right. Do you really? No, I don't think so. You would not. I mean, that would be... So, that, once again, the citizen is cut out of the process in that she, they don't have a choice. Well, you don't have a choice if you go to circuit court either. If someone charges you with a violation, you might want to go to justice court, or you might want to go to some judge that well, or to I, city I, court. I, that wouldn't happen. But they, those are justice courts, and I guess that was my question. This is a quasi-court administrative. It is not an American judicial court in any way. Well, well, in, in, in a way it is, but it's not. It's You're quasi. Right. It's quasi. It's quasi. <laughs> okay, thank yeah, you. It's a, it's a, no, it's we did not invent, invent that word. Oh, yeah. No. no I, I mean, okay. Anyone else wishing to speak? 
Seeing no one rushing up here, I appreciate you all being here today. Thank you. We'll see you next Wednesday, we hope. Yeah. No, next Wednesday. Oh, next Wednesday, we cancel that one.